Ladies and gentlemen, honored to be presenting our speaker for today. I, I was hesitating whether to refer to him as Dr. Alec <laughs> Palaki, because apparently it's one little signature away, right? It's all filed, all done, just... Can we call him Dr.? Yeah. yeah. Dr. Dr. Alec Palatik received his uh, BA in Mathematics from the uh, University of Haifa in Israel and then uh, went on to get a certification in teaching mathematics and became a teacher. And now, figure this, over 14 years of being a teacher in mathematics, he received an MA in uh, science and mathematics education from Tel Aviv University and went on to the uh, <coughs> Technion under the supervision of uh, Dr. Boris Koichu to get his PhD um, at the uh, Education in Science and Technology. Alec is here with us at the Embodied Design Research Laboratory uh, as a visiting scholar this year and a very active and contributing um, uh, member to the, uh, our National Science Foundation project on the Gesture Enhanced Virtual Animated Mathematics Tutor. The talk today is on his dissertation, Middle School Students Learning Through Long-Term Mathematical Research Projects. As I think what you'll find interesting here is the use both of uh, micro-analysis of children looking at objects and the use of uh, John Mason's uh, framework of attention but also kind of macro curricular view what teachers need to do by asking where is all this going, how do you steer this in the most productive way but on top of all of that an attempt to combine these micro and uh, micro views. What you will not see on Alex's uh, resume or CV or I wager will not be in this talk is that Alex Palapik is also a ballroom dancer of, of international stature and actually ran his own ballroom dancing a, a, a school together with his wife, Rosanna. That's right. So uh, please welcome, Alec. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dor, for this introduction. It's great to be here and I'm honored to be, to present, to talk with you uh, on subject of my dissertation here in the uh, Graduate School of Education at Berkeley University. So, um, first of all, I, in this uh, talk, I, I planned it to be two halves. Uh, first, it's about uh, some macro resolution and then about the micro uh, resolution on students' projects. But first, I want just to uh, start with the background of this study. So it starts uh, uh, five years ago, uh, and I uh, look, uh, looked for some uh, idea for my so for start my PhD research, and it was some vague idea of uh, uh, what are the possibilities and what are the opportunities for learning mathematics when you trying to deal with mathematics problem for a relatively long time. Uh, because in regular class it's for 5 minutes, 15 minutes, most of all 20 minutes and I uh, thought about something of giving the students more than a month to think of and uh, also when you look for a, for a subject, sometimes subjects find you and my principal in my school, he uh, had this idea of uh, Technology excellence track for students from 9th grade to uh, 12th grade. And so as he asked me, I was a, a coordinator of this uh, uh, in the school of mathematics in the school. So he, he said to me, okay, in this project I want them to do mathematical projects. Okay, that's, that's it. So I uh, turned to the literature and in Hebrew there is no handbook uh, about how to do mathematics uh, projects. I turned to literature in English and uh, the handbook of mathematics projects last one was written in uh, 40 years ago and uh, yes and pro basically pro the name project is not a new uh, introduction to mathematical education and science education it was it been 
by uh, Dewey and W. Kilpatrick in the beginning of the uh, previous century. However, uh, there is some discrepancy between uh, some potential where, which is seen by mathematics education and educators and what happens uh, there in field, okay? And the research about project-based learning of mathematics is mostly concerned about the existence and the right uh, to exist of this particular pedagogy. Uh, work of John Boller uh, is, was about it was a very big study, about comparative study of three, uh, two schools in England, back in England. Three years of study uh, comparing one school where kids learn mathematics, high school, where kids learn mathematics uh, regular way, and one school uh, based mostly on projects and the findings that their performance in mathematics were comparable. However, when the students were even with slight advance of the project-based learning kids, however, when um, um, the students face uh, some new for them and not uh, problems, not from the curriculum, the project-based uh, learning was better, uh, given better performance. The study of Baron was with elementary uh, students and uh, the study of uh, Halbershade uh, it was about mathematics in uh, interdisciplinary projects and I just love to cite these words it takes effort to examine learning processes in project-based learning more systematically and to develop and evaluate suitable environments for them so I can sign down this Yes, thank you. So I, uh, I, I knew what I'm doing there. And also, um, well, if we are talk about inquiry-based <coughs> mathematics education, it's also, it's uh, making, it's a big topic now. And uh, Artikel Bonhoi, they say that it's part of something that they called migration from science education towards mathematics education. However, when we talk about inquiry-based mathematics, learning of mathematics, we can't forget about some roots which are rooted uh, in history of mathematics education. Uh, problem solving from Poya and uh, work of Alan Schoenfeld, of course, uh, realistic mathematics education of Hans Rodenthal and uh, colleagues from Netherlands and also uh, the theory of didactical situations of Gary so and much more. So uh, for me, uh, when I try to develop and to design the learning environment and my research environment, I try to uh, base uh, on principle not only brought from uh, science project-based learning but also and mathematics project-based learning but also from these fields um, the these are partially very short list of uh, literature um, that are used to create this environment so uh, the work of Berman Goldberg and Koichu is about project-based learning but not in the um, in the school environment, it's extracurricular uh, project for very gifted kids. Uh, Blumenfeld Solway, it's uh, uh, most cited work about project-based learning in science. Uh, Capraro, it's about STEM education, STEM education PBLM. Edelson, it's uh, in general inquiry-based uh, learning of science, and also work of Polman and Polman and Pia. Uh, Polman uh, made his dissertation studying. Um, uh, one particular teacher and uh, earth science class for, for four years uh, and this is the uh, most cited uh, definition of project-based learning so let's see project-based learning is a comprehensive perspective focused on teaching by engaging students in investigation within this framework students pursue solutions to non-trivial problems by asking and refining questions Debating ideas, making predictions, designing plans and experiments, 
collecting, analyzing data, drawing conclusions, communicating their ideas, and finding to others, asking new questions, and creating artifacts. So for me, these were the key notes and key principles uh, for the design of the research environment and for the design of this uh, initiative which uh, in my school, which I uh, later uh, studied. Okay, so uh, the name was Open-Ended Mathematical Problems Initiative and what, what happened there? Uh, first of all, it's a mostly regular class uh, which was decided to, to be called as a technology uh, excellence track uh, and they have uh, six hours of mathematics, it's ninth grade, and additional two hours of project or preparation for the project. At the end of each year, when two and a half months, uh, so it's approximately in April, uh, we, uh, I gave them uh, a lecture. In this lecture they were introduced to ten, eight, uh, mathematical challenging problems and they split into teams of two and three and then they uh, learn these uh, they study these problems they solve these problems but what was uh, different from uh, other projects maybe they have to develop some uh, follow-up inquiry okay and then after uh, the two and a half months, they have to present their findings first for their peers and their peers will decide which projects were best and the five best projects, five best teams uh, they went to Technion, Israel Institute of Technology and present it for the students uh, of Graduate School of Education there okay. and uh, the problems, this is an example of one problem uh, some of you I uh, show this problem. It's a very known problem, uh, was used by some variation of problem used by Poya in his book and his very famous lesson. So it's division of pizza. And as you can see here I gave, this is actually trans a translation from Hebrew, and here I gave them stages, okay, so it's some kind of structured problem. And this is another problem, Zelda triangle Zelda, it's because of this shape. One of the one of the students called this, oh, this is legend of Zelda sign. So it became a Zelda triangles uh, problem for me also. And so you can see that here it's exploration of the sequence of red triangles. And also here, another one, what do you think about white triangles? Okay? And you can see that in the previous one D is find and investigate other interesting sequences so this is the cue for follow-up research and here also some ideas that maybe can be and here another project so it also the transition of the translation of the slide from the presentation it's about Binet formula for Fibonacci numbers okay so this is very interesting and unusual because, as you know, it's uh, natural numbers and sometimes and somehow there are irrational numbers here in the formula, okay? So, and there are some uh, interesting proofs about this. So the stages, I just want to, to be sure, so the stages of the students' projects, the names is what? Were like this. Choosing the initial task and engaging with it, choosing direction for the follow-up inquiry and engaging with it, and choosing the findings to report and the format of their reporting. Uh, so why this choosing? Because they, the students met with me, their teacher, and also the researcher, uh, each week, and for a meeting for approximately 15 minutes, they present how they advanced in their problems. We talk, I suggested some ideas, but then the ultimate decision was always of the students. So they have to decide and they have to choose which problem to pursue, which follow-up inquiry to build on, 
and what to present. So they facing, I think that the same dilemmas that we are facing when we are doing our small or big scale research. Okay, so the research goes where? Uh, to explore the variety of the students' mathematical projects and to identify sources of possible similarities and differences. And another one, to analyze the phenomena pertinent to the PBLM, Project-Based Learning of Mathematics, and among them, the appearance of inside solution to mathematical problem, student sense making of some mathematical object, or invention of creative mathematical products. Why these problems? Why these goals? Because one, one of the uh, problems with inquiry-based learning of mathematics and uh, with project-based learning of mathematics is that almost in each official document in Europe or in even in states, in reform movement, uh, they're talking about that they should explore, they should discover, they should construct their knowledge. However, it is very in, extremely difficult to the teacher to maintain and to do such a thing because and sometimes in, in the research and in interviews with, with teachers, in particular with young teachers, we can see the uh, utterances um, about some frustration and how can I plan such thing? It's a chaos because students can choose any kind of direction, any kind of project. We don't know what to do. And so for me, it was as a teacher, and not only as a researcher, it was very important to that this research maybe will produce some answers for the teachers and how to do the thing, how to maintain uh, and how to plan project-based learning of mathematics. So I first I will speak about uh, the uh, first view and then about the second micro resolution. Macro resolution, it's about this one, and micro resolution. So the method was of the research was a qualitative multiple case study approach when each student's project was a micro study and then I group all the projects with the same initial problem in cluster then I compared all the projects inside this particular cluster between them and among them and then I compared between the clusters of uh, different of, of projects with different uh, initial problems and the so for instance uh, to just to explain you about this diversity of the projects if we talk about the pizza project so you remember this partition of the pizza uh, when we do we get maximum number of pieces uh, when students solve the initial problem find the formula uh, sometimes one team uh, solve it using triangular numbers and then uh, one team find it particularly attractive that there is some connection between the uh, factorial and which is a product of uh, n numbers from n to 1 and the sum of consecutive n numbers from n to 1 and then the student invented this sign okay and what was interesting that the invention of this sign was for him much more important than the solution of this non-trivial problem. And he said proudly that and this was the central point of his presentation. This is what he chose to present. Uh, and he said that this can be on each calculator in the world. Okay? So, of course, because there is a sign like this on each calculator in the world. Okay, and different team of students, after studying the parts of the pizza, uh, they uh, look for sequence of intersection points, and other team look for, no, the same team look for number of these segments, 
okay, and it's also very interesting uh, uh, sequence. And some teams uh, look for partition of the plane instead of pizza. And they look for numbers of close and open uh, parts of the plane, which is very interesting uh, uh, pattern there. So it's all about one project. And uh, as you remember, these are different initial tasks in, in my case. So this is Binet formula and uh, sequence of Sierpinski triangle. They call it Zelda. And this is, was some folding sequence. And this is entrance to Fibonacci and different. OK. So uh, the key, uh, the main theoretical framework, uh, I build on two different things, okay? One was the, this notion, this metaphor of the conceptual corridor. So Jerry Cohen, when she talked about conceptual corridor, she talked about account for <laughs> all possible conceptual trajectories with certain landmarks and obstacles. And she talked about class, okay? She, she did not talk about the um, projects. So when class enters here, the teacher can know uh, about some key concepts and some difficulties in some mathematical theme. And I find this very inspiring and even more useful in projects. Because in projects, uh, I can access these, uh, I can feel these, uh, this uh, conceptual corridor with projects which, is, which are going simultaneously and year after year about each one of the projects with an with a, with a initial uh, same uh, question, with the initial same task. And also the variety is about mathematical content and also about the shape of the project, how, it, how they can navigate. So, um, to to prepare myself, I built this table. It's a, this is a part of the table. Uh, and columns are uh, name of the projects of initial, of initial task. It's Pizza, Zelda, Vine, and Fibonacci. And the, uh, these mathematical concepts, concept of sequence, recursive relationship, and formula. And what is in red are the concepts that uh, return and which are the same between different uh, initial tasks, okay? But what was most interesting then, when I started this research, I started to fill up the, the table, the particular conceptual corridor for each one of these projects, and then these are things that the students did, okay? These are the concepts uh, which students uh, search for, uh, met, uh, learned about in course of the project. So, in, and also in red, the, there are the same concepts in different in different projects. Okay? So mathematical induction appears here and also appears in, uh, in Binet, of course, and Fibonacci because it sequences. Okay? Uh, this, the, the theme, the common theme for all the projects in my study was sequences. So, but the <coughs> connection was even more stronger than I expected, much stronger than I expected. And this part of the table is some concepts that students were very close. They not actually get there. But now, after the analysis, I can see how they can go there. Or maybe, so, some combinatorial representation and Pascal triangle. Uh, so, uh, and also, there are common obstacles between, between all the projects. So these obstacles are not new. They are all uh, in the literature. Here I 
don't find nothing new. However, so in some, almost in every project, it was verification of rules by examples, they expected confusion between particular case and general rules, etc., etc. Transition from a, a local rule to general one it was a very big problem. However, if and these commonalities enable me to, to formulate something that maybe will be useful for the uh, implementation of project-based learning in the classroom. So it's a theoretical concept, but can be used as a practical concept, as a common corridor of the project. And this common corridor of the project is a union, it's a combination of all the conceptual corridors for each one of the initial problems. Okay. So it, it consists of predictable key concepts and obstacles because we know which we can we can expect for certain mathematical theme which will be core theme for the particular project, mathematical project, uh, which are predictable key concepts and obstacles. Also, uh, it is important to know and to acknowledge that there is a dynamical and collaborative updating because each, each new project which is performed by the students enrich this uh, <coughs> corridor with new concepts and create connections, new connections. And in, in such way, this, there is no, okay, we can't, I think that this is important, we can't predict each individual project because sometimes it's, imp it's a, it just, it's not sometimes, it's always, it's impossible to know um, which inspiration uh, uh, will be in this moment uh, dominant for this student. However, if we are looking not on one particular project, but on the complex of, of the projects on the same, uh, in the same uh, mathematical theme, we can predict and we can dynamically uh, update it. Uh, also, not using only our own knowledge as one teacher, but creating a network between teachers and researchers. Okay, types of the project. So, the variety is possible not only because of the mathematical concept, but also by the shape, how, how these concepts are navigated, how the students uh, make these projects, which are the types of the projects. So this, this question actually was, uh, uh, was raised by W. Kilpatrick in, back in 1918 and he proposed uh, his typology of the projects by the purpose of the project, uh, by producing some artifact or by giving the students opportunity of some aesthetical uh, uh, appreciation. Uh, however, uh, it was not used even by W. Kilpatrick, this typology. Uh, there is different typology of inquiry, inquiry-based learning, uh, of open inquiry, of structured inquiry, and uh, of guided inquiry. So it, it depends on extent of scaffolding that we gave to our student. Okay? Uh, so it was second category which was used which I use and also uh, additional category which came from microstructure maybe I will uh, I will talk about it later it was foci of the exploration so like in uh, in this pizza project we can focus only on pieces of pizza or we can focus on points of intersection or we can focus on uh, segments. So it will be three different sequences which are explored in parallel. Or we can focus on one. So foci exploration one, focus, or two. And uh, to build some uh, types of the project, I use this approach of Bigner-Asbash. 
it was explained in 2015, it much more, uh, it was developed uh, some 10 years ago, but it's very well explained here. So it's, first of all, we construct ideal type of some project or process, and then we use it for interpretive evaluation of empirical data. And the process is like this. First of all, we reconstruct the cases by building a condensed process diagram. So in my case, it was diagram of the project. Then we group the cases according to some features. For In, in my case, it was three categories. Uh, one, it's a type of the initial task. Second was uh, extent of scaffolding. And third was uh, foci of exploration. And then we construct the ideal types and then these ideal types are compared with real cases. And also it is important that we have some prototype, something that is not ideal, something that happens uh, in, uh, in real life and which is, it can be, uh, it can be compared with some ideal type. So the categories was type of the task, extent of scaffolding and for kind of exploration. So, as a result of analysis, I came up with four types of the project. First one, okay, I hope that this name says something. So, first of all, it's chain of problems. So, mainly, it's problem-solving task, problem-solving task, problem-solving task, and then uh, uh, some decision which, which findings to present. As, as, and you can see the color here indicates the extent of scaffolding, okay? So we start with structured problem-solving task, and then we are moving to guided problem-solving task, and then to open problem-solving task. As, and you can see that this is very one, foci, one focus of exploration. Uh, second, identified uh, among the grid, very complicated grid, uh, was this delving into proof or solution. So what happens? We give students some solved problem or some given proof. They have to understand it. They have to comprehend it. And then they, if they understand the key principle, if it is a proof by mathematical induction, or by using of some representation, matrix representation. So they can use it, this principle, in different cases. So here we have some guided uh, comprehension task, and then open problem solving, which is now somehow uh, presented as a result. This is the second type, which was identified. Then uh, I call it guided funneling. So we give students uh, some examples. For instance, in my case, it was properties, uh, mostly, uh, properties of Fibonacci sequence, for, for, uh, for instance. And then, uh, sorry, then they can see some invariant feature in each one of these uh, tasks, okay, or examples, I'm sorry, and then it's a guided funneling to some problem solving, and then also presentation of results. The last one, uh, actually I brought this one from Polman, uh, from his study, uh, from his study of uh, guiding science expeditions, okay, it's a doctoral dissertation. Uh, the teacher said that sometimes, in, in Pullman study, the times, sometimes students are doing this instead of real science project. And uh, this teacher called it uh, standard library research. I just changed the name to standard web research. So it's synthesizing well-known answers and descriptions of the phenomena into a report. It's it can be, first of all, mostly structured, and I also identified it, because some of my students also did this type of uh, product, of, of project. 
Uh, okay. So, uh, how it can be used, this typology, or is it just... For me, it's uh, somehow uh, used for explanation of some interesting and otherwise unexplained for me things. So, the same project, Pizza Project 2013, two different teams, uh, same, same place in the, pro in, the, in the project, and then I came and gave them one task. I said, okay, Pizza Project somehow connect to arithmetic progression, okay, why you guys why don't you read something about arithmetic progression? And one team, so it was initiated by instructor, so one team just rejected my, my suggestion, and I tried it for one week, for two weeks, for three weeks, and on each, so we talk about very interesting things, and I tried to push, as a teacher, uh, this type of, intervention and second group they took my suggestion and the exploration of arithmetic regression became the central point of the project and was presented so what happened there so uh, one type so they started this chain of problems project so they solved the problem they solved the problem and here I came and I gave them a comprehension task and one team said okay we are doing our thing we are in pro we are in problem solving business so why we should learn this thing of project comprehension and uh, for the second one I when I analyzed I was a little bit smarter I think as a teacher at least so I sell this comprehension task as a auxiliary problem. I said, okay, guys, if you solve this problem, maybe it will help them. So it was not a conflict between the problem solving mode of the project and with my auxiliary task. So they solve this problem and then, but you, you remember that actually it is a comprehension. And because they, they learned, they see this, and then they develop some, uh, apply this in some different, uh, uh, so they got the idea and they apply it and learn about this. Okay, so do you have some questions for now? Because, uh, yes, yes. Please, Anna. Hello. Uh, so I, I think I know what you mean by scaffolding, mm -hmm. but could you explain a little more about the different colors and yes. what that means? So, so uh, for me, okay, if we have structured uh, inquiry learning or structured uh, project, so we, I can give them uh, all the materials, I can uh, suggest the steps of solution, like in pizza program. Uh, you check for one line, for two lines, for three, for four, for five, and six. And in, air, in okay, I have very little scale here, and it's not some kind of uh, qualitative, uh, as a quantitative research. However, when I gave them, you have to check six stages, they always check six stages, okay? And then I said, you have to look for a recursive formula and explain what is, and they look for recursive formula. And then, so it's, it's structured in each way of the explanation. Guided, I can suggest, okay, now we have this problem. You can explore the sequence of red triangles, or if I talk about pizza, you can look for this regularity, but without explaining exactly how to do this, okay? And then uh, I can also maybe, so I don't suggest them uh, read something about arithmetic progression. 
they have to come and open inquiry <coughs> and open project-based learning it's like you have it's even more than I gave them so it's it basically in my case it started after the uh, first um, iteration so you can choose any direction you want you will deal with it as you want does it yeah, answer the question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions about it? Yes. I'm not sure if I understood what's the difference between the rhombus shape, uh -huh. where when they get the text they need to comprehend, uh -huh. and the one in the last model you offered, which was taken from somewhere, where you had different sources of literature that you uh -huh. compiled, because I would assume that comprehending these texts is part of the that, that, that's right. It's, it's a subtle difference. However, there is a difference. So, uh, if you have uh, to comprehend some proof, there are some lacunas in proof, there are some trans algebraic transformations which, which are unexplained, uh, or there are some ideas which are taken as granted. And in, in case of proof comprehension, you have to fill these lacunas by yourself. And if you just uh, go to the internet and you just copy a lot of data about Fibonacci sequence or who was Fibonacci when he was born uh, um, uh, by the way it can be great project it can be great project it can because you gather things and you learn something but you almost not uh, like uh, adapted, you, 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 your, your input is minimal. So that's for me is uh, most uh, uh, striking difference between these two that you mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, I have problems trying to differentiate inquiry-based learning and problem-based. Mm -hmm. It's like the definition you have there. I was yesterday reading a paper and mm -hmm. like the definition mm -hmm. was like for inquiry based learning. So, so it, first of all, it's it's very vague uh, field because uh, when you you I, I'm I'm sure I'm pretty sure that if you if you took the literature about inquiry based learning, they citing papers about problem based learning and project-based learning and vice versa. However, they are very specific and they are saying that we are different. Okay, so first of all there are differences. Uh, project uh, Problem-based learning can be done with one problem in one mathematic class. You, you can repeat this. Uh, if, if this is your approach, you can repeat it, but you will repeat it with different problems and you can talk about some developing of some uh, some skills and uh, uh, mathematical habits of mind. However, if we're talking about the project, project-based learning, it's first of all you have to produce some artifact. In our case, it was PowerPoint presentation of mathematical ideas, or some some kids they produce some brochure with their results. Okay. And in project-based learning in science, it can be a rocket uh, or it can be garden. Uh, if we're talking about, uh, I think Be Becky is doing something. Becca is doing uh, project-based learning in uh, biology and gardening classes. Uh, so it's it's like this. Uh, um, so the time, the the artifact, also the centrality of the of the project because you have to organize all everything around the, the project. So in this case, everything they learned about the sequences was through the project because it was not the part of the, uh, uh, it was not the part of their regu regular curriculum in ninth grade. Uh, so I actually, in my PhD thesis, I organized uh, some table uh, for differences of these approaches, you can mail it. And also in, in Capraro and Slosh, I think one paper that I cited, they also attempted this. And also, uh, 
in recent paper of 2050, now they are talking about the uh, complementary power, uh, yes, power of the different approaches. So, and for in my case, I think that this is exactly this thing because I use the power of problem solving inside the project-based learning, but it's not the only thing. So, if it helps, <laughs> but I, I also it's it's very even about projects, it's very web. Yes. Uh, do you have do you have a question? No. Uh, Okay, so this was about the macro resolution on the project, and now I want to talk about micro resolution on the project. On particular phenomena, I will talk about uh, insight solution to the challenging problem. And first of all, so some of you heard about the shifts of attention uh, framework. Uh, it's not my framework. It's framework of John Mason and uh, I will start with essential of the theory of shifts of attention so John Mason talked about learning as a transformation of attention which involves not only the focus of attention what are we looking on what we are attending to but also about the structure of attention and here we are asking not the question what but the question how, how we are looking at. Uh, for me, it was important to add another question, uh, why we are changing this uh, structure of attention uh, from, or focus of attention from one to another. And uh, so this is example, uh, Okay, it's, it's understandable what is focus of attention, but structures of attention is relatively, uh, I, I guess that for most of you is a uh, new concept. So uh, I will illustrate it using uh, the example from uh, one student project. Okay, so Mason talks about five structures of attention. Holding the pole, discerning details, recognizing relationships, perceiving properties, and reasoning on the basis of perceived properties. Okay, so we have this table that was produced by the students when they analyzed this pizza problem. So this column is number of cuts, straight cuts, and this column is number of pieces, maximum number of pieces. Uh, so you can, first of all, you hold the whole table, you look on the whole table, and then you start to discern some details. First of all, detail can be, okay, here we have two and here we have two. It's a detail. Uh, here we have two and four. Okay, maybe it's double, maybe it's uh, squared. And from discerning details, now we can switch our structure of attention to recognizing relationship. So, I can recognize this relationship. Wow, three plus four equals seven. And John Mason say that almost automatically, we, from recognizing relationship, we can switch into perceiving properties. What does it mean? So, this is now a property, and suddenly it became the property. So now I'm trying to apply this particular relationship. I'm looking for this one, not for. So I try to apply it in different way. Okay, five and six, it's not sixteen. And then I can go back because there is no hierarchy. I can switch my attention chaotically and then I go for the table and then I suddenly discern some detail okay and then I recognize different relationship 4 plus 7 equals 11 and now this is the property and I'm looking with this uh, actually 
you will see that students produce exactly these marks. Uh, so it's my uh, interpretation, uh, replica of students' marks. Okay, and here 6 and 16 equals 22. Wow. And then the next uh, one came into structure of attention. I can reason on the basis, solely on the basis of this perceived property. So the next will be 7 and 29 because 7 plus 22 gives me, uh, because I can try to generalize. So these are five structures of attention which uh, discern uh, John Mason. So uh, when one pair of students started to learn this, uh, uh, started to this project, this pizza project, first of all, they started with these diagrams. And what I was interested, so my question was, what they're looking, uh, how they are attend to these objects, and also additional question was why they are uh, why they are uh, shift from one form to another, and why this particular uh, case was chosen as a case study because these students. Uh, they search and they did their research and suddenly after three weeks they came with the formula and then I asked them uh, how you produce this formula they said it was great it was so strong spirit but we can't explain you we, 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 we can't explain it I and then uh, so this was the source of my the, the, the so I wanted to know what happened there so and these uh, guys, they produce uh, dozens of these drafts. So I analyze their drafts. I analyze the, our transcripts of interviews of our meetings. And I, uh, I produce initial reconstruction of what happens. I ask them uh, and I interview them with this, my initial reconstruction. And if they reject some of my suggestions, uh, it was put out and then uh, uh, different reconstruction, not different, but refined reconstruction was made and then approved by the, uh, these students. So, so they look on the diagrams and they discern some details and they counting the uh, pieces of pizza. And then they started to introduce some uh, actually, it was some additional step. They do the same with GeoGebra sketch. And in GeoGebra sketch, you can move your lines uh, so it's it not produce areas like this. Okay. So here it's very different, difficult for them to to see is this an area or is this a point. But in GeoGebra, you can't write uh, easily. So they have to develop some kind of notation and they produce these strings of numbers. But then they understand that it's better for them to produce these tables. And then uh, it was their uh, work. So uh, and, and they worked in this way. They produce, they took a giant sheet of paper they made some templates, they put uh, the numbers from 1 to 6 and sometimes they uh, put their 0 and they look for patterns. So their attention was now on the table and I can suggest uh, where they were looking because I can see their uh, traces. So they produce this diagonal pattern, and these are zigzag pattern, and uh, these are horizontal pattern, and these are some mixed pattern. And each one of these patterns, uh, they came up with some formula. And mathematically, 
these three formulas are the same. But all of them are different because they came with, and this is also a little bit even, I think, wrong, yes, because they tried to connect it somehow, but it's recursive formulas, okay? It's, it's the same. It's like this. And then they understand that to produce, I ask them for closed form formula, not for recursive one. Then to produce the recursive formula, they have to concentrate on the vertical pattern. Because the recursive formula is something that, that connects not only two adjusted uh, rows, but it somehow collects all the data which is here. And what happens is they came up with this one. And this is the moment. So, and the student was at home, according to his uh, interview, and he tried to hold, to hold the whole table. And then he discerned some subsets of the set of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then he recognized their relationship. 6, and he said like this, I notice that 6 divided 2, it's 3. Wait a minute, it's 3 there. And I don't know why, and now I'm citing, I think, this one, yes. Uh, I just multiplied it by 7. I get 21, and 21 is very close to 22. I add 1, and that's it. But then it was another uh, detail discerned that 6 and 7 are not uh, arbitrary uh, things. They are coming one after another. So he tried, so he perceived this also as a property. And he tried this, as he said, with all the numbers before 5 and 6, 6 and 7. And when he succeeded uh, with 5, because 5 divided by 2 is 2.5, two and, and then he multiplied it by 6 and, get the and add 1, and get the result, it was the aha moment for him. So, and then it was a moment of verification. Uh, how did you convert it into, it was a difficult part for him. I did it really in line with the arithmetic operations. So why, why I think that this is the example of insight solution? Because the theory of insight, which was developed in, by Adamar and by Wallace, uh, talk about uh, stages of collection data, then uh, you try to solve something and then you stuck. And then there is an incubation process. So the students were stuck. It was some incubation process of for, for a week. And then they tried to do something. Then it was an illumination because it was very high uh, moment for, for the student. It was an illumination moment. And when it was a verification. So, uh, to summarize this, first of all, uh, present the account of student exploration towards inside solution was presented. And it, actually, it's rare occurrence of this kind of, of work of students uh, in our literature about project-based learning and inquiry-based learning. So, I look on this uh, through three lenses, what was attended, uh, how it was attended, and why shift occurs. So these shifts occur because necessity to move on to, because each one of the objects uh, produce some uh, affordances and some constraints as a GeoGebra sketch, which can be moved, but it's difficult to write on it. And also, uh, the occurrence of insight was a particular combination between the object, so the vertical pattern, and combination of two different uh, properties which were discerned. So the combination between the right object and the two 
properties which were disarmed simultaneously produce this uh, inside moment and which uh, this is also in line with some theories about insight uh, one of them is representational change theory which talk about some decomposition uh, of given information if you want uh, it's about like nine dots pro famous nine dot problem uh, for instance which is chunks of information given and then some new recombination and then it happens but here uh, I think that Mason theory gives us much more detailed lens so now we can talk not about only so it was decomposed now we can talk how it was decomposed by combination of two different uh, properties by discerning of two different properties and combination of them uh, uh, so just to combine some findings of uh, macro and micro resolution uh, I think that uh, I came up with some uh, uh, points uh, about mathematical research project uh, first of all it's a dynamically constructed sequence of tasks so it, and it can be suggested by the teacher or self-imposed by the students it should be uh, over extended periods of time because these extended periods of time gave students the opportunity not only to explore but as we see to shift their attention from different objects uh, getting more higher levels of abstraction and it gave them this possibility to uh, to make a mistakes as we can see because some points of their research are cul de sac and uh, so the mathematical products can be relevant to a particular mathematical community uh, if we are creating our project uh, our projects in our classroom which are connected by the mathematical theme it's not only uh, convenient for the teacher to prepare it also enable the, the students to communicate about their research because and I in my study I saw that one team came to other team I also organized their meetings so they know they talk about sequences and they talk about this using the same language so they talk about recursive function they talk about explicit function they talk about sequences they uh, they use the same notation which is developed different ways and this is also some cross-pollination of ideas happens uh, so this is relevant to this particular community central role of problem-solving tasks in each one okay it was by design but I think that uh, the role of problem-solving is central to mathematics and in mathematics education uh, the extent of scaffolding uh, should be the right uh, it's not a new idea but some uh, products uh, can be impossible without a structured uh, beginning and then guided and then open uh, because in case I have some cases uh, out of these 23 when uh, they I gave them open scaffolding in the beginning and uh, it was not a disaster but it uh, the students came up with some defensive reaction for instance they just said okay it's too open so we took some known problem with known solution and we work on comprehension and it was just different project, great product, but different one. And reciprocal refocusing and restructuring of students and instructing attention to the particular aspects of the task, of tasks. So as I said, uh, the instructor intervention can be not by okay, you should read about mathematical uh, induction. It can be by 
okay, let me focus your attention on this particular aspect. Or, and also the students can focus the attention of the tutor on some particular aspect. Sometimes tutors uh, don't get this, as in my case, it, will, it took me like four weeks in some projects that they are not into mathematical progression and they are into problem solving and let us explore this, but now I'm, I hope that I am wiser. And uh, some further directions uh, I see, so Dor said that now I am in embodied uh, research lab. And so there is some interesting connection between structures of attention of Mason and the theoretical concept of attentional anchor, which is proposed uh, first by uh, Kuton, such as Garcia, and now then developed by Abramson and such as Garcia. And uh, so, additional direction is that about conceptual corridors of the projects. So, it can be done by connection of teachers, of network, creation of network of teachers who are doing project based learning of mathematics and sharing their results and sharing the trajectories of their. Uh, of their uh, students. Also, of course, I will love to uh, see how different subjects are suitable for project-based learning of mathematics, geometry or uh, 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 some uh, points of analysis, or calculus. And I, okay, these are some uh, papers if you want about some particular aspects I will send you, of course, and also I just want to finish this part of the talk with the citation from uh, Mason. The purpose of research in this world is to develop personally and professionally in a way which makes you more sensitive to others and of more use to them in their own search or research. Uh, so I hope that uh, I feel that my research helped me to become a little bit more sensitive. And, uh, thank you, and I'm waiting for your questions. <laughs> attention and here we have their uh, changes between uh, structures of attention and so if we want to know something we have to use different lens so uh, because it's I see this okay maybe it's not so good metaphor but I see this more as Newtonian laws of physics and if we are looking here, it's much more uh, like quantum because, because also because of this uh, uh, unpredictability of one particular project, how it will be developed. However, we can think and we can know how can develop a bunch of the projects. So. I, so I think that the, for, the, for the teacher, 
it is important to be aware, first of all, of mathematical concept of these key concepts and difficulties which are constitute the project and also about the shape of the project so this can be done like this and this can be done like this and this can be done like this and if you are uh, directing your students so if you giving one particular task you should know that this task is comprehending task or problem solving task and the extent of scaffolding that you are given by the even by the formulation can be directed into open inquiry or uh, inquiry or into more structured one and also if you are focusing them towards one goal like study red triangle sequence or you can do red and white so and this can be totally different uh, development of the project. So that's, uh, that's the connection between my, my, micro resolution and macro. The micro and macro. Yes. Is this? Thank you. Yes. So, quick question. So how does this look in practice? You're the teacher, children are working, students are working in groups of, you said, two or three. Mm -hmm. And so, how many 30 <coughs> kids, 40 kids in this classroom, so I... Okay, so... Um, and you're moving between the... Like, yes, so it's, it's not like this, because the learning happens not only and mainly not in the classroom. Because uh, they have these two hours and they came there to meet me and they sitting and then discussing their ideas between them and then they, they have this schedule and they came and uh, I'm sitting there and so they are, they are here and we discuss and then it's a hot seat and they move on and sometimes they want to meet me first uh, in the beginning so they have my input and then we, they will work on this inside the classroom and sometimes they just want to prepare themselves and they organize it uh, practically uh, uh, in very active way but the learning uh, and the problem solving happens on the during the recess at home and they just came and tell me and they show me the drafts and they show me now we find this one, what do you think about it? This is our direction. Or, we don't know, one of the most uh, central things was we solve it all after the second week. Now we know all about this project. So, so I asked them, okay, so, so how you can continue? You have additional time. You're not going to work on your presentation now. Okay. And you also, by the rules, you have to develop some follow-up inquiry. And then it started to develop. And also one of even, even best teams, they ask, we don't know what to do. Uh, we don't know what, is the, uh, what are our main findings. So the dilemmas are like ours. Basically like, so I don't know what my what I'm doing here, I'm stuck. <laughs> so, that's, that's like this. And it was just one word. It was wonderful opportunity for me to get these windows into the... Yes. Um, so, I have a several questions about the process of so you said, you, you, from time to time you were saying things like best work projects, mm -hmm. so I was just wondering what you consider, based on what criteria is a project better than the number? Mm -hmm. And another question is, I get generally curious about student engagement, specifically since it's seen in, in the team that you zoomed in on, that mm -hmm. one student got the inside solution, so what was happening with the team members, how is that interaction involving? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, I will start with the second one. Uh, so, first of all, it was interesting dynamic between uh, the uh, members of different teams. 
and the structure that uh, it is not only about problem solving but about the developing some uh, questions and also developing the products and presenting so sometimes it took uh, them uh, almost all the project to get one of the members to be involved uh, so they suddenly at the end they feel that uh, it come the closure is coming and they suddenly want to be there in to be best projects and suddenly they started to, to be motivated and to present and to organize so it's it's uh, more uh, it, it gave them some opportunities to engage in different ways so if you are good in problem posing maybe uh, some crazy solutions or some you are just have to prove something so you are scrupu in scrupulous way moving from one formula to another uh, and also it was some very interesting transition uh, one was leading and then something happens and it one of the members of the team lose his interest and then suddenly the second one is leaving. However, some of the projects, uh, both students were not interested in this type of learning at all. And they said, okay, we are doing this only because we have to. Uh, we will collect the data and they collect the data and almost, but at some point they were interested in something at least doing beautiful presentation or presenting m much more more cases of Fibonacci sequence in nature or in uh, music or in architecture uh, so it's about and the the types of engagement were also very different because one of them said I'm doing this to be in Technion to present in the Technion and second said I will do the project, I'm very interested to, pro to solve the problems, I will not present nothing. Uh, uh, someone will do this and uh, luckily we have two members in the team, so and it keeps his promise, he, will, he sat there, he answers the questions from the audience, from the academic audience, but he never uh, stepped on the podium, never, just, just never. So. It can be very and uh, what was the first one? Uh, ah, best, best, the best and the. Uh, uh, so some of them, so it's it's difficult to say. It was not my question. What what is the best project? What is the good one? Uh, for me, this typology is uh, good enough because it makes some uh, order in this chaotic uh, matter of project-based learning for the teacher. Thank you again very much, Alex. Thank you. Thank you.